Welcome to the Dr. Vincent Buscemi podcast. This is the survival guide for dentists. There's no clinical information, but what they don't tell you in dental school is that you need to treat your body like a professional athlete, your mind like a stoic philosopher. You need to be mentally and physically prepared for the trenches of clinical dentistry, and this podcast will get you there. This is Carrie Bennett, or she goes by Carrie B. Wellness. I think I need to reevaluate my entire life after this interview. I, like maybe many of you, thought nutrition, food was bottom line, the best way to improve your health and to treat your patients better and to live a better life. And I don't think that's the case after talking to Carrie. It sounds like light, circadian rhythm, hormone control, electrons, is the way to go, and that is actually the way to increase mitochondrial function, and maybe it's not diet. If you know anything about quantum biology or what Carrie calls quantum living, this is kind of the way to go. It's something I have to look into. I need you to listen to this podcast. Here's another picture of Carrie here. I need you to listen to this podcast and really hear what she has to say. I think that syncing up your circadian rhythm and improving what even Max Golhane says, your light diet, I think that's going to increase your life, increase your happiness, and make you a healthier person. Carrie, thank you again for the podcast. Guys, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys soon. Do you feel stuck on the financial hamster wheel? You thought you would be further ahead, but sometimes you feel like you're running in place. My name is Dr. Howard Polanski, a former dentist and now founder of Cashflow Coach USA. I help families and business owners improve their cash flow, not by tripling your income, but by being better on how you pay your expenses. You will be guided through a simple, practical system so that you can use your energy from surviving each month to thriving each month. The average client improves their cash flow over $30,000 per year. So if you would like to go from surviving to thriving, let's do a complimentary discovery call and see how soon you could find financial freedom faster. And so Carrie, I cannot thank you enough for coming on my podcast. I got to ask you a question. What the hell is quantum biology (laughs) and why are you so interested in it? That's a great question, Vincent. And um, that's the exact same thing I was asking about 10 years ago when I first found it. Like, what the hell is quantum biology? And I think the best way to describe it for people who are new to the topic is the fact that the body operates below the level of chemistry, right? And so maybe we can go back to high school chemistry and we realize that, yeah, the body is made up of a bunch of chemicals and a bunch of proteins but all of those are made up of atoms. And each one of those atoms is made up of combinations of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And those electrons interact with photons. And so we now know enough about the body at that scale, the scale of electrons, protons, photons, to say that we can influence the physiology of the body for good or for bad, you, you, understanding the body at that level. And so that's kind of what I've been doing over the past 10 years or, or so, just really learning about the, how the body operates at that scale. How do we influence it at that such low level or that intimate level? Yeah, I think there's a, there's some important things to recognize and that, I mean, where do you want to start? We can start with light, we can start with water, but I think there's a couple of key things to understand before the pe- people are like, oh yeah, now I'm making that connection there as to how that can influence the body. Well, I think what my audience is very heavily keto and carnivore inclined. And I heard you say in a previous podcast, diet's like one of the, I don't want to say last things, but it's not the most important. So I'm going to be blown away that diet doesn't influence. Let's start with light. Yeah, absolutely. And this is in that statement that you heard me make, I've got a master's degree in applied clinical nutrition, right? So I totally understand that nutrition is important, but it is the last thing I will touch to optimize someone's health. And and then if I need to, I will. And I mean, don't get me wrong. A crap diet is not going to help, not healthy. But I now have found clinically that understanding light and improving one's light environment is foundational and more important than even what they put into their bodies. So let's go there, right? 
So yes. let's talk, let's talk first about like, what is light? You know, I don't think we think much about light. It's there, right? Whether it comes from a bulb or a screen or the sun or a fire, it's all the same. It just lights up my space so that I can see. And when it's gone, maybe I'll flip on some artificial ones so that then I can see again, right? And it's not a big deal. And what we've now realized over the course of the past two decades or so of research is that we've got sensors all over our body, in our eyes, on our skin, in our subcutaneous fat, and even inside of our body at deeper levels that are sensors for different wavelengths of light. And so that tells us something. It says that my body is looking to key in on different colors of light. And so that's where we have to recognize that if I were to shine a little sunlight through a prism, everyone would have seen this before, right? The light breaks up into the colors of the rainbow. And each of those colors represents a different wavelength range. So red is a specific range, blue is a specific range. And then outside of those ones that we can see through a prism are the infrared wavelengths, which are above the red, and the ultraviolet, which are below the violet. And we now know that we actually have sensors, or we could also call them receptors or chromophores for so many of those different colors that we've discovered. And that that light and how we apply it onto our skin and into our eyes signals so many different pathways in the body or optimizes different pathways in the body. And when it's off, when we're not necessarily signaling it correctly, shit can hit the fan and a lot can go awry. I have to imagine all this artificial light throws everything off dramatically. Dramatically, dramatically, because what is the key wavelength range of light that we key in on? It just so happens to be blue light. The blue light range of light is what sets our circadian rhythm. It's what helps to elevate blood sugar in the morning, right? It helps to, to allow us to have what sometimes what people will call a cortisol awakening response, where we have a little bit of an elevated blood glucose first thing in the morning. And that's great because if we were getting blue light just from nature, we would have the appearance of it would pop up right at sunrise. That's when those little sensors in our eyes would start to perceive blue light. We'd get a natural activation of this cortisol surge happening through some signaling with the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenal glands. It's beautiful, right? We get this surge, we get this blood sugar kind of flood happening so that we can get our day rolling. But what happens now is that we're not seeing that sunrise light as the first hit of blue light. The first hit of blue light we typically get is because we wake up and we want to check what time it is. And our screen is right there. Our phone screen is right there. And it, that phone screen is a huge artificial surge of blue light, similar to blue light that intensities that we would be receiving in the middle of the afternoon from sunlight. So you can imagine all of a sudden I go from getting this gradual blue light elevation from sunrise until the sun reaches its high point in the sky at noon to all of a sudden flashing my eyes with it first thing in the morning or in the middle of the night to check what time it is or, you know, uh, after sunset as well, when there's no blue light coming from the sun, if I were living outside, all of a sudden I'm staring at this blue lit screen in the middle of the evening or late into the night, it's throwing things off massively. It is the prime driver, in my opinion, of hormone imbalance by far. And also, you know, I mean, to a one, a one extreme example of hormone imbalance, specifically with a hormone called melatonin, that would be things like cancer and neurodegenerative conditions, things that actually require melatonin to repair and heal. Um, we're just seeing them at astronomical levels because of the fact that we're surrounded by this artificial blue light all the time and don't realize that there's health consequences to it. So I always heard that blue light at night prevents you from sleeping because it lowers melatonin. And I actually interviewed Max Golhane and you were on his podcast. Yeah, and he had yeah. the same glasses on, but he was also saying like you were too, that blue light before the sun gets up throws you off the entire day too. Yeah, it absolutely can. So we're designed to tell time by the gradual appearance and change of blue light from the sun all day long. So before sunrise, our little blue light receptors in our eyes and on our skin, those melanopsin receptors are not picking up any blue. The sun reaches above the horizon, we start to pick up the blue wavelengths of light. And then we pick up more and more and more and more blue until solar noon when the sun's at the high point, and then less and less and less and less blue until sunset when the sun goes below the horizon, we're not picking up any of that blue light anymore either. And so that's how we tell time. The day has started, the day is going, 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 and the day is waning, right? And then it's gone, the sun, and then it's darkness, right? And over and over again, we've got millennial worth of like this repeated pattern from sunlight. 
that we've only recently modified within the past hundred, well, I mean, hundred years, 150 years with artificial light from the light bulb, but really a lot within the past, I'd say decade with the type of lighting we're using now, the LED lights from screens and light bulbs, which is just so, has such a sharp spike of blue light that never changes. So look at your phone at 4 a.m., feels like solar noon to your brain. Look at your phone at 8 p.m., feels like solar noon to your brain. If you're under artificial light all day, it's never changing. So my brain's like, what time is it? What time is it? Is Nothing's changing. Like we're kind of in zombie land. And that right there can throw off so many pathways in the body that are dependent on what we call a circadian rhythm or timing in the body in order to be uh, to function optimally. Well, let's kind of dive into that. What pathways are starting to unravel when your brain always thinks it's high noon? Well, you can picture the two hormones that I see most dysregulated are cortisol and melatonin. And those two hormones work in a circadian fashion. They work, they are released, they're meant to be released at a set time and surge within a set time over the course of a 24 hour day. And so we're typically meant to have that cortisol surge happening around eight o'clock in the morning as that sun reaches bright enough in that morning surge. And then it goes down, down, down until it's very low in the afternoon. And then what picks up at sunset when no blue light is present is this a gradual increase of melatonin that then surges in complete darkness sometime, oh, let's say around midnight or so, give or take about four hours after darkness, and that stays elevated throughout the night. And then it starts to go down as the, the sun brightens the sky in the morning. And so we're built to release those hormones at those set times for key purposes. That cortisol release in the morning gives us energy. It actually also, those signals help to optimize uh, the hormones that are responsible for fertility as well, because the pathway that gets signaled to make cortisol in the morning also signals the production of pregnenolone, which is a master steroid hormone that can become testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. And so we have a circadian surge of certain hormones. For example, testosterone has a natural daily surge of about nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. Like it's, so it's, we're meant, it's meant to happen on kind of like this predictable basis. Then at night, when we're meant to search that melatonin, right, that melatonin at night one, doesn't just put us asleep. It actually runs so many key pathways for repair while we are asleep. It runs autophagy, which helps to get rid of broken cell parts, broken proteins. So you can imagine how that's really important for things like neurodegenerative diseases, where you have the accumulation of these damaged proteins. It's supposed to run apoptosis, which is a program that our, our body runs to kill basically cancerous cells, cells that are growing uncontrollably or that are just super inflammatory for the tissue. The body goes, get rid of it. It's no longer serving us. We got it. We got to wipe it out. And then we also use melatonin that we make to to even do things like reestablish glutathione levels, another antioxidant pathway, another repair pathway. And when we don't get the signaling at the right time, when we get the blue light at the wrong time, or, we, or we're not making enough melatonin, these things go awry. And so the main things that I hear are um, easy, easy ones to come by. I hear things like, I'm, I have insomnia, right? Insomnia, I can't fall asleep, or I get a second wind at night. I'm tired all day long. I got no energy. And then all of a sudden, can't go to sleep before 2 a.m. I get the second wind. That second wind happens because we, when we see a blue lit screen, whether it's a TV or a phone or a tablet or computer, when we see that screen past sunset, the brain goes, oh crap, I thought the day was ending, but all of a sudden we're in the middle of the afternoon. We got to surge that cortisol. Carrie needs more energy. She's got to hunt and find and gather that food and make those babies and, you know, build a shelter and all the things that she needs to do for survival and proliferation. And, and so, so there I get that artificial cortisol surge. Now, the problem with that then is that as that cortisol surges, well, my brain goes, well, then Carrie can't go to sleep. We got to tank the melatonin, push that melatonin down. And so now we're getting cortisol surging at the wrong time. We're suppressing melatonin. And pretty much now every inflammatory disease you want to look up is connected to a dysregulated cortisol melatonin pattern and dysregulated what we call circadian rhythm. Most of the clients that come and see you, is that the pattern that you see? Is that maybe they're just ignorant to the, to the negative effects of blue light? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. It's well, And I'll put it this way. I think by the time people get to me nowadays, they recognize that I am going to address light environment and the blue, like when to go outside and kind of sync up your circadian signaling when you have to be very diligent about blocking the artificial light. 
Um, but the two hormone pathways that I optimize, well, there's three that I optimize before ever thinking about estrogen or testosterone or DHEA or some of these other hormone pathways, you have to optimize the cortisol and the melatonin first. You have to correct the timing of when daytime is and when nighttime is happening. And the energy surge that happens in the morning with the, re with the ability to regenerate at night when we sleep. When those two pathways are optimized, so many other cascades optimize. There's so much more homeostasis that, that, that the body goes back into because it knows what time of day it is, when to be energetic and when to repair. Can you kind of, say I come to you as a client, can you kind of walk me through how you would optimize those two hormone pathways? Yeah, sure. Well, first and foremost, I think education is key. I love teaching about this stuff. And so my first thing is very similar to the conversation we just had about even explaining how light is made up of different colors and that the blue light is what we use to tell time and that we need to block our exposure to it before it would appear naturally from sunlight. So I would tell clients that if you wake up before sunrise, you have to then use orange toned blue blockers and or a red phone screen, right? We have to minimize the amount of artificial blue your eyes are picking up so that you can go outside. And I tell people to get a hit of sunrise, go outside, naked eyes, sky gaze, east, sky gaze east, and try to recognize it as you go outside, your brain is picking up the blue wavelengths and making that communication to your hypothalamus and your brain to tell you what time of day it is that the day has started. And so I have clients really do that consistently, block the light until they can go outside, go out and sync up. And then on the other half of the, the, the day, I tell them again, when the sun goes below the horizon, there's no blue light that your eyes would be picking up. And so we again, have to minimize their exposure. So we got a, around, around sunset or maybe not by up to an hour later, we have to again, put the orange tone blue blockers on so that we can tell your brain it's nighttime and it can make that melatonin. So we get the morning surge of cortisol, we get the nighttime surge of melatonin and those start to regulate themselves. So it seems like the orange glasses, I think mine are red at home. And I noticed you're wearing orange ones right now. And these, it's are not, these are yellow, actually. Oh, Vincent. yellow. I know. I got some yellow. These are yellows for my daytime screen use, right? Um, these are my oranges. My orange okay. ones. So you wear the, oh, wow. You wear the orange ones at night or right because max has like three different pairs of glasses too so oh my gosh those are the now, red ones <laughs> now, now we have a, a comedy show so tell me <laughs> if because i'm very interested in this and my guests are too if they're going to invest in these glasses what color when easy easy peasy if you're getting started with this your best investment is a good quality pair of orange toned blue blockers because Orange, the, the orange from reputable companies, it doesn't have to be an expensive company. It just has to be a company that's done their testing. Um, but the orange will block the blue wavelengths of light from entering your brain. So you put them on, you have them on before sunrise, take them off, go sky gaze, and then you put them on after sunset or a little shortly thereafter. And again, you block the blue light from entering your eyes. So orange, you have to think of orange will filter out the blue and that will protect your melatonin. Sometimes clients need red, very rarely, but red blocks the blue and some of the green wavelengths of light and really dims the light entering the eye as well. And so for my clients who are like, I haven't gone to sleep before 3 a.m. in three decades, I recommend these because this will really help to phase, help them phase shift their bedtime earlier. Um, but really, if you want the biggest bang for your buck, these are the best way to go. Get a good pair of orange tone ones and start applying them before sunrise and after sunset. And then you, I've just found that like, you know, I have transitioned from owning a gym and not being in front of a screen to being in front of a screen, right? And so while I have some protective features, I my eyes feel best when I have these, this particular brand of blue blockers on, the yellow tone blue blockers. So I recommend yellows for people who are maybe in what I call a garbage light environment. Like let's say you work in a factory all day long and you're under that fluorescent light or you stare at a computer screen all day long without lots of natural light in your workspace. That would be what the yellows are for, but they're, they're like a tweak that happens later. The orange is where people go first to start experiencing the effects of this. So ideally, though, you would wake up when the sun gets up and you wouldn't get any artificial light before. Absolutely. But, I mean, I wake up at 4.45 a.m. I just have to because my work schedule. I'm assuming a lot of your clients, yep. 
Is that where the is that red or that's the orange? These are the orange ones. Yeah, these are the orange ones. Yeah, just gotta wear the orange ones, right? I mean, you can wear the red ones too. They're just gonna be. It's gonna be for me when I would wear the red ones. It's hard for me to see around the house because I keep the house dim, really dim as well. Um, so the orange ones are really all I need. I can wake up early. I can get what I need to get done. I can make some lunches for the kids for school. Blah blah blah, all that stuff, and still protect my circadian rhythm. Are your kids wearing these glasses too? It's a great question. So two of my kids are, well, I got a four and a six year old and they really, we really wind things down screen wise before we need to, especially in the summer, before we need to worry about eye protection with them. We have a filter down here is where we call our kind of our, our family viewing time. We've got a TV down here and we have a screen protector that is made up of this, like kind of like a, a, an orange acrylic that goes over the screen. So that's fine, right? For all intents and purposes, we're good with those with them. We, they come outside a ton with me whenever possible. So it's great. Their circadian rhythm is strong. My husband, who has been with me on this journey for, you know, well, we've been married for almost 13 years. Um, and then my 12 year old have just within the past year, year and a half started asking for the orange tone blue blockers at a certain time of night. They recognize that when it starts to get dark out and like if, we, if we're not on the TV that has the screen protection, if we're on just what my, my husband calls like the normal TV <laughs> upstairs, um, they don't like how it makes their, their body feel when they're staring at that bright television screen after the sun goes down. So they've been, they've started to request wearing them without me pushing it. Like I recognize that pushing it was not the way to go with clients or with anybody a long time ago and just to live by example. And sure enough, they now feel that visceral, visceral kind of discomfort when, if they happen to be staring at that bright screen too late into the evening and they know they have to find their orange tone blue blockers. I love that. I practice functional orthodontics and I want my kids to wear their functional retainers at night and I almost have to put mine in to show them what they need to do as well. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Just got to live by example for sure. So yeah, that was, uh, when I, when I, let, let's put it this way, when I pushed it was when there was a big pushback, right? So. Yeah. So if you were clinical nutrition to start, what triggered you to even like think about this type of science? You know, my healing, like I had a healing journey as well, right? I healed from some, some pretty severe adrenal fatigue where I had completely like flatlined cortisol levels and all my hormones were off. Um, and so I thought that getting a master's degree in applied clinical nutrition would solve it for me. So I got a master's degree to try to help myself. But in the meantime, I've been getting more and more complex clients and just with what the, with the tools that I had in my toolbox, including a master's degree in clinical nutrition, the needle wasn't moving enough, right? It's like, oh, maybe I'm just a mom now and this is how good I'm going to feel and I'm always going to feel a little bloated and I'm always going to feel a little pain and I, my, my energy is going to be low. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to accept that. And so I knew something else I was missing. I just had this feeling I was missing something else. And that is when I stumbled upon a blog from Dr. Jack Cruz. And if anybody has heard of Dr. Jack Cruz or has read, or has read a blog of his, it's an intense amount of information, but he was talking about new things. He was talking about light and he was talking about how that my light environment mattered. And I was like, wait a second. And so, you know, I did a quick PubMed search circadian rhythm and sure enough, there's like 6,000 articles right off the bat that popped up regarding the importance of circadian rhythm and optimizing my health. And that's when I knew I had struck a gold mine with his, with finding his work and then diving deep into all the research because I had never thought about how light was going to impact my health. And as soon as I applied a couple of key things consistently, that moved the needle beyond what anything I had done nutritionally had ever moved it. So that's when I was sold and that's when I started applying it in clinical practice. So was it your own personal exploration that made you believe this? Because some people would read that and think, this is complete BS, time to move on. Are you such an independent thinker that you were willing to try it or why were you even willing to consider it? I feel like I've always had an open mind, you know, after, after my undergraduate degree in a very, very traditional pre-med style learning like biology and pre-med, I felt the need to go to massage therapy school, which was like completely different way to view the body, but still cool, equally cool. Right. You know? And so, um, I've just always been a learner, I would say, and kind of seeking out information. And the way he presented it was such that I was like, this man is really speaking with a lot of authority on this and a, 
and like, you know, I, he had had so many blogs at the time already done that once I, you know, made my way through three or four of them, I was like, okay, that this, this has to, there has to be something here. And so that's when I started taking all of the people he mentioned in his blogs, Alexandra Wunsch and Maywan Ho and uh, Preparada and Del Gudice and Gerald Pollack and all these people. And I was like, okay, let me dive into their work. And once I convinced myself then that this was all legitimate, real science and, and not even like that I care about science that much, but also the clinical application was very much not only easy for my clients to apply, but they saw results. All of that just was just made me realize, OK, this is something that I've been missing for, you know, three dozen years of my life and something I want to learn all about. Well, it seems like we're all kind of missing this because, first off, the environment is truly set up light wise to not be healthy for us. The food environment is too, but light's worse. But it's more than just like sleep quality. Oh, yeah. It's definitely like the timing. So mm -hmm. are you worried about how long you sleep or even like your sleep hygiene? Oh, absolutely. All that matters, but that all gets optimized with this stuff, right? So like, you know, think about this. We're meant, I'm meant to, I'm designed to go to sleep a little bit later based on my latitude. I'm designed to go to bed a little bit later in the summer because it stays out later. Or the sun, I'm sorry, the, it's lighter later, right? And then I'm, so I'm meant to sleep a little less in the summer. Maybe I get about seven hours of sleep consistently in the summer. I go to bed around 930. And then in the middle of winter, shoot, I could fall asleep by eight or 8.30, no problem because of how quickly it gets dark around here in the afternoon. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily just about like, I need eight hours and it's okay if I get to bed at two o'clock in the morning, as long as I get eight hours, we're designed to fall asleep a, a certain amount of time after we, we, A, we kick off our circadian rhythm in the morning. So about 16 hours later, after we kick off our circadian rhythm, we're meant to go to sleep, give or take that shifts a little bit far farther forward in the winter when it's darker and a little bit later in the summer. And so it's kind of natural to sync up with when I'm designed to go to bed, when I just give my body the correct signals, I tell it when it's daytime, I tell it when it's darkness. And then when I fall asleep, I'm likely asleep in a nice deep state of sleep when my body goes into tissue repair, that first four hours of sleep. And that tissue repair coincides with really elevated melatonin, a surge in human growth hormone, you know, all these, all these other pathways and cascades that can really kick off at the right time of day because my body knows the time of day and knows when I'm supposed to go to bed and run those programs. So your adrenal fatigue you mentioned a little bit ago, was that due to just improper circadian rhythm? Yeah. So picture this, right? Like I think I said before, I, I don't know, did I, did I mention when we were talking live that I owned a gym, right? Yep. I, I took all of this information as a, like with an undergraduate degree in biology. Like I was, listen, my professors were like, you're doing what? And I said, I'm going to massage therapy school and I'm opening a gym, right? I'm becoming <laughs> a personal trainer because uh, I was a college athlete as well. And so, um, picture what happens when you own a gym. Well, I was there at five o'clock in the morning under fluorescent lights, you know, teaching these classes and never once thinking about going outside. Like I was driven. It was like, okay, uh, let me book client after client after client after client after client. So I would flip on every light in the house to get myself ready because I live by myself. Woman live by myself, right? I wanted bright lights. I wanted bright lights in the garage. I, I drove to the, I drove to the office, flipped on all the lights there, you know, bright lights didn't care about going outside. I didn't think anything of it. Or when I did, I was wearing sunglasses because I had very, very much a bright sensitivity to the sun, to the sunlight then. Um, and then I would come home, shut the, shut it off around dinner time, shut everything down, go home. And then again, wear my sunglasses as I drove home, flip on every light in the house and cook dinner. Didn't matter what time of day, but like I, I was, I'd go outside randomly here and there. It's like, oh yeah, let's go to the beach. Everyone's going to the beach. Let's go hang out at the beach. But I was by no means consistent with getting outside and sinking my eyes to the natural light. And I was very good at flipping on random lights all day long, way too early, way too late, and completely dysregulating everything. So what got me on this journey in the first place of adrenal fatigue was actually massive digestive issues. Like that's what triggered me. It's like, I knew I had fatigue, right? But like I was a go-getter. Yeah, I can push through this fatigue. Yeah, I could nap anytime, but I can push through it. But when I ate an avocado and a half of an avocado and I was doubled over in pain for four hours, I knew something was wrong. I was like, why can't I digest a freaking avocado? Right. And then tried something else. Why can't I digest an egg? Why can't I die? And so that's what got me into the nutrition rabbit hole first. But even like I said, that only improved things a little bit. But once I optimized my circadian rhythm, 
And believe me, I tried every diet. Once I optimized my circadian rhythm, I, I, I'm not even gluten sensitive anymore. I don't eat it, but I'm not even sensitive to it anymore. And I was severely sensitive to it prior to understanding circadian rhythms. That blows my mind right now because mm -hmm. I'm like maybe a couple of years behind you in my own health journey because I've somewhat perfected my diet and I'm starting sleep now. So were your hormones just so whacked out that your stomach acids or your gastromobility wasn't working correctly? That's exactly what it was, right? My stomach acid was just tanked, tanked because, you know, when you, if you think about it, I was, so here's what happens, right? When you apply cortisol or when you apply cortisol surges all day long, whether it's because you're legitimately stressed out because of a psychological stress or you're doing it because you're underneath this bright blue light all the time, those cortisol surges, your body can only handle so much. So at one point I was in this stage where I had just like elevated cortisol all the time. And that's in the stage looking back where I was hangry a lot. Like I'd have these blood sugar right, ups and downs and ups and downs. So like, you know, like a good personal trainer, I was fueling my metabolism. I just need to fuel my metabolism every couple of hours. right? Um, but then I reached that point. The brain can only do that. The body only wants to have cortisol surging for so long. And then it shuts the pathways down in the brain. And one of the pathways that it shuts down is called the paraventricular nucleus. And so basically you just downregulate cortisol completely which flatlined me. And that's where I was just like, I can't digest a thing. I can, I could go to sleep at any time right now. And just, I want to close my eyes. I feel like I'm in the middle of a movie theater with a boring movie on. And I, I just, I just need to sleep at all hours of the day. And that's when I was just like, I, I knew something was off and I recognized, you know, in hindsight now looking at it and also through my learning journey that, gosh, I was just stressing my body out with light. And that stress was downregulating my digestion, just shutting everything down on me. And I had to optimize timing as the first step on this healing journey. What was your caffeine consumption like when you just felt totally shut down? And how does it affect your circadian rhythm? Mm, that's a great question. Yeah. So what I used to start my day off with was going to the coffee shop near my gym. And I would get three lattes with caramel syrup in them, three lattes. And I would have them probably all prior to about 11 o'clock in the morning. Were they um, iced? How did you make? Ice lattes. Were... Yeah, these were iced lattes. I would just, yeah, I would just. <laughs> oh my gosh. Listen, I'm embarrassed. I've never <laughs> said that on a podcast before, but no joke. That's what I used to do, right? That's what, and I could, I mean like, and I, frankly, I was like, oh, I can do it. I'm a personal trainer. I, I'm still fit and I'm burning all these calories and blah, blah, no big deal, right? Um, gosh, I look back, I, I cringe at it now. Um, but yeah, I was totally doing that. And so what is, and then I was also in this learning journey, I tried to throw in strict ketosis, strict intermittent fasting, and all of these things can actually, when not applied correctly or at the right time in one's healing journey, they can actually be more stressors. And so I was just stress. I was stressing out my system massively. When I started to kind of like get puffy, it's like, wow, I'm 10 pounds heavier than I was before. Like that's, let's go strict keto. That was also not working for me, right? That was that actually crashed my hormones even more. And then I was like, well, let's intermittent fast with it. Let let me not eat until two o'clock in the afternoon. That crashed my hormones even more. And so all of these things contributed to like this extreme fatigue and just di just dysfunction all over my body. And it didn't matter what I ate, right? It, it didn't matter any of that. I had to get my light right before my body would start healing. So what does the caffeine do to the? This is like spike cortisol. Spikes cortisol. You, th yeah. you think it's high noon when it's not supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. Or like when I was flatlined with it, it's like when my body, when my PVN was shut down, I was still spiking it artificially. You, so you get like a little bit of an adrenaline surge, you get a cortisol surge. So I was trying to artificially in the course of, let's say 5 a.m., the coffee shop open at 6, 6 a.m. until 10 a.m. I was trying to artificially surge cortisol because I wasn't doing it naturally. And so I was just using caffeine as a substitute for what my body was meant to do, but it had downregulated that pathway naturally. So fasting is, everybody talks about it. Me and my friends like brag to each other, like, oh, I fasted 24 hours. I'm like the best guy ever. Um, what is it doing to your circadian rhythm that's a negative? It's not necessarily messing with your circadian rhythm, but if you're trying to fast in a state where you have bad circadian signaling, and typically this is a hormone we haven't talked about. The other only other hormone I look at first is leptin. If we if if leptin is off and our circadian rhythm is off, then fasting actually can be a big time stressor for people. 
And it can also cause these really dysregulated cortisol surges, or I'm sure you've read the literature, or you if you've ever done like a three day fast, you got like so much energy, you get all of this surge of these stress hormones, because your body's like, find some freaking food, go, 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 we're gonna like downregulate your sleep. And some people misinterpret that as I've got so much energy, I feel so great, you know, and every once in a while, when it's the right time, based on kind of like these other things I'm talking about, it's great to do. But like if you're using it when your body is already depleted, your signaling is off, you're already in a stressed out state, your leptin signaling is off, it can just make things a heck of a lot worse long run. And you made an interesting comment a couple of minutes ago where you said you just thought, okay, I'll fast a little more, I'll restrict carbs a little more, and then I'll finally get it. It's like thinking like I'll make a thousand more dollars this month and then I'll be happy. Yeah, exactly. So, so exactly. do you have, when clients come to you, are they keto low carb too when they're thinking like what the hell is wrong yeah most of them are keto low carb most of them are carnivore um or most of them have been on a vegan diet for like a, an extended period of time let's say around the two-year mark and it's like everyone feels good at first i feel like everyone feels good at first no matter what diet it is but but without their circadian rhythm like on point they reach this they reach this plateau let's some some at times it's six months into it sometimes it's two years where they're just like it was working or I felt better. I thought I felt better. What's going on now? And it's like they re they search for more, and so they want to either find another diet. So uh, I'll have sometimes carb uh, low carb people jump to the pro metabolic style eating, or I'll have vegans go completely carnivore. It's like, but like they're missing the point, right? None of it's going to work to the best of its ability until you set the foundation of what your body is looking for, which is knowing what time of day it is and knowing when to repair at night. Is that what you mean by? The food is also information because it yeah. tells you what time of day it is. Well, that's part of it, right? So the way that the way that I coach clients to eat, if they if they ask me, you know, if we really if that's kind of like I said, that's an advanced step. But I tell them you have to start to learn how to eat locally and seasonally. You have to eat what would be growing in your light environment. Because food, you know, in the in the in the food wars online, people say Carbs are good, carbs are bad, fat is good, fat is bad. But all, what all those things ultimately are is electrons for our mitochondria. Sure, they contain some nutrients too, right? But every single thing we eat ultimately to, be, to become energy for us, which I define as ATP and water, all of those things have to break down into electrons. And those electrons, electrons are the way that we interact with light. So those plants, in order to grow, had to capture a certain wavelength of light to kickstart the process of growth, which is why in Michigan, I will never have a banana tree. There is never enough intense sunlight to grow bananas in my backyard, but I sure as heck can have an apple tree and grow those apples. It's because of the, the amount and the intensity of light that gets captured in those plants to drive their growth. And so if I eat seasonally and locally, as those electrons go to my mitochondria, they release light. And that light tells time for my mitochondria. Oh, this is a really intense wavelength of light. Carrie must be in the middle of summer where she's eating apples and peaches and blueberries and 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 squash. You know, like there, there, there's a different signaling that happens and it has to do with the light, not the carbs or the fat or the protein itself. Just listening, it's like we are so intimately connected to mother nature and or we should be, I should say. Correct. And we are so distant. Do you know who Dr. Stephen Hussey is? Oh, yeah. I love Stephen. Yeah, yeah. I, I just had him on the podcast the other day. And I'm watching his Instagram. He's laying in a river. He's grounding, which I want to talk to you about. And we're so disconnected. This seems kind of doom and gloom. But what's going to happen to us? And the more we get engrossed in technology and the more we're in con these concrete jungles? Well, you know, I think what's gonna happen is what we're seeing happen right now. More and, more, more and more of us are gonna get sicker. We're gonna get sicker at a younger age. What may have worked for us to feel better will no longer work. And we're gonna to have to seek out new information and open our mind to new ideas, which is exactly what happened to me. It's what happened to Steve. It's, it's what happened to all of us, right? We had to find a different way of viewing health. And that's what I think is gonna to have to happen. People have to have the impetus to change. And it's hard to tell people that their screens might be causing them harm or that their technology might be causing them harm or that living under a roof with you know closed walls and windows might be causing them harm. It's hard to kind of bridge that gap. So a lot of times, unfortunately, 
people or someone they love has to go through a health crisis for them to, to start to seek out different information. And the information is there. Steven's awesome with this. His book is brilliant. I have it, I've, I've, you know, I have it right here on my bookshelf. Um, he also went through this certification program that I teach about this because more and more medical practitioners are looking for this information and, it, and have it structured in a way for them to say, tell me all about light and mitochondria and water and earthing and how do I teach my patients and clients how to use it to heal? Because I know the tools that I have in my toolbox are not enough anymore. Well, let's go into earthing because it's so funny. Almost like my kids intuitively know every time we're outside, my kids are young, but their shoes are off. Sometimes their diapers are off, but my sure. kids love to put their feet on the grass. Yeah. What is earthing doing for you? Oh, so many things, right? Earthing is doing so many things, but that yeah, kids, kids know, like kids inherently know. I tell people, trust the wisdom of your children when you're in, when they're outside because they will, they'll take their shoes off or in the middle of winter, sometimes they'll just take their coat off because they got hot, right? And like, we were like, no, 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 put your coat on, yeah. right? Like you're gonna catch a cold. Kids, kids don't, kids can heat themselves up and that's good for their mitochondria. It's just so cool to watch kids just innately understand this. Um, so what is touching the, any bare skin touching the earth actually does something called pulls electrons from the surface of the earth into us. So now like sounds woo, but actually it's very well established that Earth's surface is like this infinite source of electrons. It has an electrical charge to it. And then if we go on, well, how does my body utilize that? Well, it, my body is designed to run on what we call a net negative charge. So maybe you've heard, right? Like the interior of the cell has to have a specific voltage or a cell membrane has to have a specific voltage. They're all measured in millivolts or negative millivolts, negative 70 millivolts, negative 50 millivolts. That's just the scientific or research-based way of saying we require a massive amount of negative charge in order to maintain the health of our membranes, the health of our cells, and the health of what we would consider the communication conduits throughout our body. And so how can we get those, those, elect those electrons or that negative charge? Sure, we can eat some food, right? Some of, the, some of that food becomes electrons, like I said before. But one of the ways that we were designed to do it is by touching bare skin to earth, which, would, which we would have been doing pretty much 24 seven, just about, oh, I don't know, 500 years ago, we, we wouldn't have had a choice but to do that. And that allows us then the ability to pull electrons into our body and we can funnel them. We can do something called semiconduct or funnel them wherever we are starting to lack that negative charge. So we can reestablish membrane voltage. We can reestablish what's called the zeta potential around red blood cells. It's this halo of negative charge that helps red blood cells float freely through the vasculature. Um, we, can, we can send them to sources of inflammation, which in essence is actually excessive positive charge or a lack of electrons. And we can calm the reactive oxygen species or we can calm the inflammation that's happening in certain areas of the body simply by making contact with bare skin to the earth. So we can get these electrons from food and from touching the earth with bare skin? Yes, those are two ways. There's more. There's more, but wait, Tell, there's more. Wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Where yeah. else can we, can we get these electrons? Well, let's talk about water, okay, inside our bodies. The water inside of our bodies actually is also negatively charged water. It's what Dr. Pollock has called exclusion zone water, or, you know, you want to dive into the research, interfacial water, bound water. It's been called a lot of different things. But what, what Dr. Pollock's work really highlighted in his book, The Fourth Phase of Water, was that that water, typically, if I were to measure charge or voltage in, in a glass of water, if I were to measure charge in just a, liquid, a glass of liquid water, it'd be neutral, right? The oxygens and the hydrogens, they balance out the electrons and the protons. There's no, there's no net charge, it's neutral. But when he measured the water inside of our cells and on the outside of our cells, he found it held a negative charge. And so water inside of us structures itself in a way that it actually holds electrons. It's electron rich. And he also found that by applying a certain wavelength range of light, of sunlight, you can charge that electron rich water fourfold. And so it, it's the, a wavelength range of light called infrared or kind of mid to far infrared light, which from the sun, we get it all the time from the sun. And when that sunlight strikes our skin from sunrise to sunset, no matter the time of year, we charge that exclusion zone water. So we maintain this net charge with simply using the water inside of our bodies as another way to maintain our electric, our electron rich bodies. 
And these electrons give us energy or they fuel the mitochondria? Yeah, they can do a couple of things. They can fuel the mitochondria. We need a certain to, to make more water and ATP, right? That helps with protein operations and that making of that water just help is like a, a nice feed forward cycle of helping to maintain the water inside of our cells that can continue to get structured into this negatively charged exclusion zone water. Um, this exclusion zone water also, uh, the, the electrons, it provides a conduit, right? It provides a, a, another kind of like wire, if you will, through which we can funnel electrons anywhere in the body. So again, just like with earthing, if your membrane, if your me a membrane potential is lacking in electrostatic charge, we can funnel electrons there. If there's inflammation, we can funnel electrons there. And in order for certain things to diffuse into and out of the cell, the cells have to maintain a certain charge. And so they have to have this negative charge inside of the cell of approximately 20 to 25 millivolts. And when that starts to go down, it changes the ability of things like oxygen to diffuse into it, or it changes the, the functionality of the cell. And so we can start to reestablish that, uh, that charge simply by maintaining this exclusion zone water. When you mention electron tunneling, is that what you're talking about? Like it's moving towards... <laughs> Yeah, I would call the electron flow through the um, exclusion zone water more of a, a semiconduction pathway, what we call like an N-type semiconductor. But the electron tunneling happens through the mitochondria for sure, because the mitochondria have something called the electron transport chain. Which okay. I'm, I'm certain all of us have heard about that, you know, uh, at some point in science class, maybe eighth grade science class. And that the end result of the electron transport chain where the electrons tunnel through, step four is where they help to make water. And then step five is where ATP is made. And those are really key components of cellular health. Have you read Chris Palmer's book, Brain Energy? Mm, no, I have not. So he talks about, he's a psychiatrist from Harvard, and he feels that mitochondrial dysfunction is the root cause of psychiatric illnesses. Sure. Um, mentions nothing, though, about light. He's actually more of a proponent of a ketosis diet. <laughs> Yeah. Um, some of them, but, like that, that, the Harvard research is interesting, but they're big on like NAD plus supplementation. And, yep, yep. Yeah, keto, yeah, yeah. So do any of your clients come to you with maybe anxiety and depression, and then they've started this form of, I guess, quantum living, we'll call it, and have they resolved those symptoms? 100% without touching diet at all or supplementation. I, because I believe you because you look so honest, but like, I, that's like, it's like blowing my mind. Because I'm so pro diet, but tell me so, more about that. Yeah, so let's talk about it. So if mitochondrial dysfunction drives anxiety, let's 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 take that statement from this. Do you say Dr. Palmer? Palmer? Chris Chris Palmer. Chris yeah. Palmer. Chris Palmer. So let's take that statement from Chris Palmer. Well, what is mitochondrial dysfunction? Well, it's an inability to have a, a intact electron transport chain flow. You're not making enough ATP and you're not making enough water. That's definition, right? And when, you can, when you're not doing that, you're also then generating more, you're losing electrons. You're making more reactive oxygen species. That's a part of the metabolic process. And so, okay, agree wholeheartedly. But I, what, what I'd love for him to do is dive into the research that shows that blue wavelengths of light, isolated blue wavelengths of light, like we get from all this technology we're around and light bulbs, actually inhibit electron flow through step four. So you're not, you, the light alone stops step four or inhibits it, which means I'm not making water. That's what's made at step four. And when I inhibit electron flow, the electrons back up, like you get this dysfunction, this spread you lose electrons, you lower, the, like, I know I'm speaking your language, right? You lower the membrane potential of the intermitochondrial inter membrane space. So you're not going to drive ATP production as well. So that's mitochondrial dysfunction from blue, isolated blue light. And then when you apply red, which is a wavelength range found in all of these red light therapy devices, and is this huge field of research called photobiomodulation, you reestablish electron flow and functionality of step four, cytochrome C oxidase of the electron transport chain. So simply by modulating light alone, you can change mitochondrial function. And so when you understand that, you realize how important the light that we apply to our bodies is to any disease that has a mitochondrial component to it, which these days I'd say it's about 99% of them. <laughs> yeah. All I'm hearing is I can eat donuts if I get my light. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, there's like, there's deuterium that we haven't talked about that there's food can jam things up a little bit or food can just create inflammation unnecessarily, right? Like why add in more inflammation to, uh, to our bodies in, in a modern environment that's already driving it up, even when we try to mitigate it. 
but every once in a while a donut's okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so how would I apply this red light therapy? Cause I, I see like Dave Asprey and a bunch of what they call biohackers putting this on. It, who's that one guy? He's like worth a billion dollars. He wants to be 18 again. Ugh. Brian Johnson. Oh, I don't um, know okay. So he, he like lives in red light. So how can I apply that to increase my health? Number one, I wouldn't do that. Um, but number two, so the research started very interesting, right? And there's this database. I, you have access. I can give you access to it. It's like this free database that this researcher has been compiling over the course of a decade or two that was highlighted like at least 6,000 to 8,000 red light therapy or what we call photobiomodulation studies categorized based on things like oral health or bone health or neurodegenerative conditions. And what you look at from this database is you're like, okay, they're applying certain wavelengths of red and near infrared light to the body, to the naked skin at a set distance and a certain intensity, and they're seeing beneficial results. Typically they see beneficial results. And so um, then the research really went to, okay, well, I think that there's what we call a biphasic dose response, meaning if you don't apply it, you're not going to get a benefit. And if you apply it too much, you actually can cause harm. And so people were saying, okay, 20 minutes. When in doubt, start with red light therapy, about 20 minutes, 20 minutes, about 12 inches away from your body, right? And in an area that you feel needs attention, gut health, mental health, joint health, right? Apply it there. But clinically speaking, and this is not a recommendation for anyone here, but I have had many of my clients far exceed that amount, but not to the extent that you see that you, you might, you talk about with that individual, but let's say use it an hour a day or two hours a day and see major healing results, major healing results, simply by applying red light. Basically just means that they've been blue light toxic. Their body has been starved. Their mitochondria have been starved for red light. And so we now know what the, the mitochondria do with those red wavelengths of light, and they just upregulate energy production and improve inflammation. So they've been so low in mitochondrial function because they're basically in blue light 24 hours a day that just a little red light application, like the same way you described, like once you enter a new diet, you automatically feel much better. They almost got right back up to regular functioning. Yeah, I mean, you have to apply the circadian light, right? You have to do the other stuff too. That's yeah. just a, that's just a, that like, that's a tool. That's a device. And I mean, I, I understand this because what people ask me oftentimes is, well, what device can I buy? And I'm always like a pair of orange blue blockers and then get your ass outside, go outside, get the light signaling. Like that's the best thing you can do before you buy any type of a device. But the one device that I do think is super supportive is a good quality red light therapy panel simply for what you talked about, right? When you start to sync up the timing, then the mitochondria also that are keying in on the timing as well, they're tying into our circadian rhythm. They can optimize energy production to support what time of day it is and what type of tasks we're asking our body to do at the cellular level. So absolutely, you can start applying that red light therapy and, you know, when in doubt, 20 minutes on a certain spot and give it a try. That's great. So I want to respect your time because I know you got to get out of here. I always ask a couple questions at the end. The first one is, what is one takeaway you'd want the audience to have from this hour interview? Go outside. Go, go outside. outside with naked eyes. Yeah, go outside with naked eyes, no matter the time. Like right before this, uh, this interview, I had like three minutes. What did I do in those three minutes of time when I was, because I was on the screen before that? I went pee and then I went outside, right? And I had maybe 90 seconds outside of sky gazing. But when you apply that consistent, like syncing back up with the natural, all the natural light colors, my body knows exactly what to do. It starts to optimize everything for me. So when in doubt, just go outside, naked eyes, right? Naked eyes and just, just be outside and allow the body to kind of sync back up with those signals. Isn't it crazy that something free is like the best thing for your health? You know, here, like, but here's the deal, right? I, that's why I didn't believe it at first. It, too good to be true, BS, oh, it can't make that big of a deal, which is why I had to like legitimately go down this crazy scientific rabbit hole before I even started applying it for myself. And then when I started applying, it was like three days later. And I was just like, oh gosh, well, why didn't I apply this like three months ago? Why yeah. didn't I just trust it? But like, yeah, I had to understand it because it seems too good to be true and too easy. That's crazy. So this next question it probably doesn't apply to you because you're kind of a celebrity, but I always <laughs> ask my guests at the end, where can they find you? Are you taking on new clients and how can people reach you? But, um, but you, you have like a plethora of assistance before they can get to you. And um, no, I mean, yeah, <laughs> like I just, I'm, I just love the fact that this information is like scaling and people, people want it. Right. So uh, if you want to get it, the best way to find my information is Instagram. 
Carrie B Wellness. I just try to post this stuff in like these little bite-sized chunks if at all possible, even though they're kind of intense still, um, just to get this information in as much as possible. I'd, I get to do podcasts like this. This has been so enjoyable and you can find me on um, podcasts. So Carrie Bennett Quantum is one of the ways that people find me on the different podcast um, platforms and YouTube. And then my website, carriebwellness.com has how you can access my private community or take a course of mine or join that certification program that I talked about earlier. So um, just ways to kind of get further engaged with this information. That's awesome. And you have your own podcast. You just started with a colleague of yours. Tomorrow it launches. Yeah. Oh, so, tomorrow it launches. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Sarah Kleiner and I, Sarah um, has been, had a life changing experience from this information as well. Um, and so she and I are just so passionate about sharing it that we wanted to bring it to a place where people felt it was accessible. Right. And so like we talk about this and how to apply it and just want people to start to engage with this information because because to answer your other question, I can only do so many one on ones and they're really, really booked up and booked out. And so I'm trying to get this information in other ways to people in a podcast is a great way to do that. You're a superstar. I'm uh, so lucky to know you. Thank you so much. Gonna, so I'm we're going to tell my children you said that. Yeah. <laughs> like, Mom, that big nerd, that quantum <laughs> nerd. <laughs> yeah, but in like 10 years, they're going to look back and go, holy shit, my mom is super smart. <laughs> so I'll get a we'll, hold of you, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll end this here, but I got to have you back on for a part two. I really appreciate oh, yeah. your time. Yeah, absolutely. This was so much fun. Thank you, Carrie.